Hello, I am Dr. Kathleen Hall, and this is the way I see it. Today we're going to talk about miracles don't take reservations. Yeah, miracles don't take reservations. I love this title. I love this topic. It's one of my passionate topics. Are you ready for your very own miracle? Because you're about to hear how it's just waiting to happen to you. Okay? Are you ready for your very own miracle? When we hear the word miracle, many of us associate the word with, you know, spectacular events that rarely occur. It's only unique. It happens once in a lifetime. It may happen after prayer or people working hard or being holy. But most of us conjure up images of dramatic events when we think of the word miracle. Events like, you know, when a terminal cancer patient has spontaneous remission or um, somebody sees a religious figure in an apparition or, you know, in that in scriptures, rising from the dead, spectacular healings. It's always or usually dramatic occurrences. You know, we see this frequently, an earthquake victim or somebody trapped in a mine for days or weeks and they find them that's touted as a miracle. So uh, it's kind of a normal topic or a normal um, concept for me. I grew up Catholic and went to a Catholic school and all that stuff. Um, so I believed in miracles. Of course, it was part of the Catholic faith. I mean, all these saints going around and miracles happening everywhere and in scripture. So, you know, it was part of our storyline of our faith. Whereas my husband, was Baptist, and so a lot of my friends are Buddhist and other things. And again, I'm not Catholic anymore. But still, they didn't have the foundation as a childhood of that um, being one of the roots of their faith. So I know for some, it's 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 a foreign concept. But throughout history, individuals have experienced visions. Um, I'm sure everybody has heard, you know, of course, the Virgin, the Mother Mary. So, you know, there have been sightings of her in Fatima, Portugal, Our Lady of Guadalupe, Mexico, um, Lourdes, France, just to name a few. So those are considered miracles. And of course, things like the Shroud of Turin, which has been sent around the world and it claims to be the cloth that uh, Christ was buried in. So, so they consider all those kinds of things miracles and um, general popular culture. And the Bible is filled with Jesus' miracles healing, raising from the dead, even his resurrection. So these are famous historical things that I think when people talk about miracles, they think of these spectacular, once in a lifetime, you know, uh, catastrophic, huge events. But you know what? If you look at the definition of the word miracle, all it says is it's a surprising and welcome event that is not explicable by nature or scientific laws and therefore considered to be the work of a divine agency or a cosmic agency, okay? So, and, and also similar words are mystery or a sign or a symbol. So it's, in another definition is a, a miracle is a highly improbable or extraordinary event or development or accomplishment that brings very welcome consequences, okay? That's pretty cool. Or an amazing achievement or outstanding example of something. So these are definitions of miracles. So if you think about it, it really doesn't say anything huge has happened, right? It doesn't say anything like we have defined it currently. And I agree wholeheartedly with these definitions, but most of us believe in the concept of miracles. We do. But we see it as set aside as unusual experiences, or appearances or healings that are rare, once in a lifetime, kind of like lightning striking. But I don't believe it. I believe they're not rare. I believe that miracles are happening every time, everywhere, all the time. And in my long, rich life, I can attest to the fact that miracles are happening every moment of every day and are happening in the most covert silent, and in such obscure ways, right in front of our noses, right in front of our eyes and our ears. But our current world is not designed for us to become aware of the pure joy and awe and wonder of these miracles that are available to each of us in the most normal, mundane, and everyday environments of our daily life. Miracles just happen all the time. 
Remember, the definition, definition says highly improbable or extraordinary events. They're in your life. But maybe you're so overwhelmed with your fast life, chaotic life, um, whether you're a mother working in school, uh, you have these goals or you have these attainable benchmarks that you want. We're not aware enough and we're not slowing down enough and you're missing these amazing mysteries that are happening all around you. Missing the simple yet magnificent miracles surrounding each of us every day is a horrible loss to our souls, seriously, and to our human experience. You're missing some of the greatest opportunities on earth. A miracle really does stop you in your tracks. A miracle can change your perspective on life, change your attitudes and values, and miracles can change your vision. It's like um, I wear glasses, so it's like having your glasses off, and then when these experiences happen, it's like putting on a new pair of glasses. You know, bright red, clearer vision, unbelievable. They can change your faith your life and your hope forever. So what I'm asking today is please expect miracles. Expect encounters with angels walking on earth, divine or cosmic entities, creatures, experiences that transform the mundane of life into a divine wake-up call. Okay? You were meant to have a life like this with all of these things opening up to you. Not a mundane, scheduled, boring you know, life of expectations. No, no, no. Remember, miracles don't take reservations. They happen spontaneously in a flash, in a second, in a moment. And again, it's like the Red Sea parting in your heart or a flash of lightning in your brain. But most times you don't experience it. Most of us don't. We don't experience this life-changing realm or appreciate it or can define it until it's over, it's gone. And my mother, you know, I never thought of, of it before I uh, created this podcast. My mother believed uh, that life was one series of miracles. I, I didn't think about it till now. She was a kind of a Dorothy Day person. She believed that, um, that she, she grew up in a family of 12 kids, and she believed, and her, her mother, my grandmother, taught her that every stranger you see walking down the street, I don't care if they have a Chanel dress on, I don't care if they're homeless and have tattered, dirty clothes on. I don't care if they're black, white, yellow, pink. I don't care if they are have, have you know a lost leg or ugly, beautiful. My mother embedded in us the belief that every stranger that you don't know is some kind of miracle or some kind of little angel visiting you just to wake you up and change the mundane or, or regular or constricted perspectives or attitudes you have on life. She always, my mom, always referred to Jesus and his love of the stranger. Remember the Samaritan in the ditch, the people he healed, the women that walked up to him uh, out of nowhere that maybe had sorted past. It was always a stranger that transformed lives around in these stories that he told. And how the stra this stranger can transform your life. And it always comes as the divine or the cosmic or your higher self or God in a different form. And when judgment happens or fear of the stranger or a different experience, you're taking out some of the most exciting, thrilling, life-changing things that can happen to you. But let me go back quickly and tell you about my mom. There were no shelters in Florida when I grew up. So what happened was uh, they grouped uh, an organization, grouped churches together. So it was uh, a rabbi, priest, uh, it was uh, ministers, all kinds of people of different faiths, and community center people. And what we did was everybody organized and said that when the police found a homeless person, that everybody took turns. So the Jewish community took turns one day, the Catholic community took turns the next day, the Buddhist community took turns the next day. So everybody rotated that if a police, uh, the police found some homeless person wandering the streets with nowhere to go, you were up if it was your turn. So my mother was on the list, of course, and we had seven kids in our home. But mom was on the list and she believed that, you know, and every time we were on the list, she'd wake up that morning and say, we're on the list today. So we could get a stranger. Well, we would wake up. 
we would eat breakfast and our stomachs were actually butterflies because we were so excited that maybe we were going to get a call or the police were going to come by that day with a stranger, with a living miracle, with something that we hadn't expected. So we were raised that way. And, and it was really kind of funny and strange, and my mother was hilarious. So I'll never forget when the phone would ring and the excitement on my mother's face. She'd hang up the phone, circle all of us kids around her, and she'd say, guess what? A stranger's coming today. And we all knew what that meant. And so each of us had our jobs getting ready for the stranger. I had to strip my bed because that's where they usually stayed and put on fresh sheets, towels in the bathroom, make sure the bathroom was clean. My mother went straight to the refrigerator and began cooking. And the other kids cleaned up the house. So we were so excited. Then after we were finished, we were adorable because uh, we were stair steps. We would wait at the front door looking out the window and wait for the police car to come in intense anticipation. I mean, seriously, we were so cute now that I look back on it. Then the police car would drive up, he'd open the back door, and out would walk a man or woman. And the police officer would slowly escort him to our front door. And, you know, the person was usually maybe a little messy, dirty, you know, clothes looked as you would expect. And um, the officer, we'd open the door, and they made, the person would make little eye contact at first. And the police officer always thanked us and smiled and winked and turned away and said, if you need anything, and he'd always leave his card and say, call me and good luck. So if it was a woman, it was me. I was the oldest. So I escorted them to the bathroom and helped them into the shower, or made sure they had clean new clothes. My mother kept a container in the garage with men and women's clothes. And if it was a man, my brother helped him, you know, get into the shower, clean clothes. So that was the first step. And then we'd eat supper together. And we always sat them at the head of the table. I will never forget this because my mother felt that it was truly a divine intervention that this strange person was entering our normal mundane household and so she felt that it was literally a divine presence so they sat at the head of the household and it was all we could do as kids not to stare my mother always led the conversation and we always looked <laughs> because she guided our responses you know she'd give us the evil eye if we got too personal and then she'd smile if we said something really sweet but there was always laughter and tears and always a surprising story of oh unbelievable pain or suffering or a difficult life or, you know, uh, mental health issues, oh, abuse, whatever. It opened our hearts and our minds and our souls. It was unbelievable. So every stranger became a living miracle in our lives. And again, remember the definition of a miracle again. It's a highly improbable or extraordinary event, development or accomplishment that brings very welcome consequences. So it was an amazing life filled with surprises all the time and living miracles. So when Jim and I got married, I decided to continue this uh, life-changing practice in our own home. So uh, we have had, you know, women and children who've maybe been living in cars who've escaped uh, spouses hunting them down or violent, you know, violence in their homes. We've had um, children and teens who've lived on the streets in boxes. And, and we even had a nun one time. So it's been a litany of thrilling miracles that have transformed all of our lives by these strangers coming in. And, and again, every story is so shockingly different. Um, it, it's just like, I don't know what to tell you. It's like lightning striking, maybe, or the, or the Red Sea parting for us. But it's a great opportunity and a blessing to take in the stranger and allow them to teach you more about the divine or to teach you about compassion or love, maybe your own judgment your own fears, the terror of totally surrendering to a situation, and acceptance of other people. But there's just too many life lessons to even imagine. And what I wanted to share with you today was a personal miracle story that happened to me recently. It happened, but miracles can happen in grocery stores, airports, in traffic, at bus stops, <laughs> even at McDonald's. So this is my little um, short McDonald's story, and this is one of my favorite miracles. Um, I experienced a miracle recently at McDonald's, and it was an event that changed my life truly in untold ways, in a flash. It happened in a flash, happened in a moment, and it was a result of a simple decision, and there it was right in front of me. Um, I'd been having a rough patch. Uh, things just weren't working, no matter how I prayed, how I worked. 
you know, I'm very into motivation and inspiration and spirituality. So I'd had my list. I read the Tao. I was reading my Buddhist books. I was praying, walking, you know, eating my usual vegetarian stuff. Man, but oh, I, I just kept saying, God, please, I'm trying everything. Help me. But I was like in this fog, and it was different than a depression uh, because God knows I deal with depression. It was a like sideways, nothing would work. So I was struggling with my daughter. I was frustrated. I was struggling with my career, my calling. Should I write another book? Is it is it the time to birth another book? Is it time to start another foundation? What am I supposed to do with the Mindful Living Network? Please, God, guide me. Let me know what I'm supposed to do. So I was very anxious. So I said, you know, beautiful Atlanta. I'm going to go for a drive and clear my head. So I looked at my wallet before I left the house, and I had $2. And that's pretty normal for me. I never, ever, ever have any cash. I never have any money. It's just been part of my affliction of my life, as my husband tells me. He's one of those people that leaves with all this money in his wallet in case something catastrophic happens. I'm one of those people that, for some reason, my doctor daughter and I, we just kind of just go through money. I don't know why, but we just cash. We just don't keep cash in our wallet. It's just kind of an affliction or something. I don't know. So anyway, I said, I better go to the bank and cash a check. So I said, well, I'll go cash a check for $200, which to me is a lot of money. So I felt depressed and thought mm, on the way back, I thought, you know what? I'll stop at McDonald's on the way home. Uh, the girls were with me, my two fur babies, my dogs, my Jack Russell. So I thought, well, I'll get some iced tea for me and I'll get a burger for them. And, you know, maybe I was feeling flat as a flounder. So I said, you know, maybe it'll perk me up. I'll get a tea, uh, get them a burger and drive around for a little while in the sunlight and, and maybe it'll get better. So I walked into McDonald's, ordered the burger and the iced tea. And then when the employee repeated the order, I stopped her and I said, hmm, you know what? I get iced tea every time I come here. I said, I don't feel so good today. Uh, why don't you change that tea to a Coca-Cola? And... I always feel better when I have a Coke, and I haven't had a Coke in a long time, and I need one, so could you do me a favor? Just change that order to a Coca-Cola. She says, sure. So she gave me an empty cup to fill up the soda dispenser. So anyway, I took the empty cup. I went over and sat down and um, with my empty cup, and I waited for my order to be filled, and I waited for me uh, you know, be called with my order filled. And guess what? I noticed a woman sitting at a table on the other side of McDonald's with a really old tattered suitcase. I mean, it stuck out just an old, I think it was like supposed to have four wheels. I think it had three, and, but it was different. That was tattered and old looking, but she was middle-aged, beautiful. Her clothes looked, you know, a little unfinished, but they weren't too bad. So I was confused. I went, what's going on here? She just looks so put together. And I wondered if she was homeless, uh, but she caught my eye because there was an energy. She was pretty. She was so pretty. And I saw her smile and her teeth were just perfect. And I thought, God, what? There's some kind of power or strong energy field around her. So I was going, hmm, what's going on here? So I wondered why I was almost staring at her. And I had to keep, you know, managing myself not to look at her too much because I didn't want her to think I was staring at her. But just then the McDonald's employee called out my order number. And I walked up and I picked up the burger I'd gotten for the dogs. And then I went over to the Coca-Cola soda machine and began to fill up my cup. And just as I had gotten the ice and I was filling up my cup, I swear to God, a voice over my shoulder said, don't you just love Coca-Cola? Don't you just love Coca-Cola? I am from New York, and a lot of people drink Pepsi up there, but there is nothing like a wonderful Coca-Cola. There's just something about a Coke that makes you feel happy and that everything's going to be okay. You know, it's kind of like a cup of hope to me. And I turned around to see who was talking to me. And it was that woman. I swear to God, it was that beautiful woman with the suitcase. It was that woman that sat across the restaurant. I'll tell you the truth, I almost fainted. It freaked me out. She also had an empty cup to fill. I couldn't believe it. What if I'd gotten that Coke? What if I hadn't gotten the Coke, I mean? And what if I'd stayed with my original order of iced tea? I would have grabbed my bag and I would have left. I never would have met this woman at the Coke machine. So I was asking God, what is going on? And since she asked me about the relationship, my relationship with Coca-Cola, and I live here in Atlanta, the home of Coke, I told her my love affair with Coke started in Orville, Ohio, when I was a little girl five years old. And what happened is we went to Mass every Sunday. My mother was devout, and sometimes she had no money, but sometimes she would have enough money 
so that she would take us to Dick Zarl's pharmacy. And that's when pharmacies had had uh, little uh, fountains in them that you, you could order a little food, you could order a little soda. So we would sit up there and a Coke was five cents and a uh, bag of potato chips was five cents. So for 10 cents, which if there were six or seven of us, that would be 60 or 70 cents for all of us to have a Coke and a bag of potato chips. Now, this very rarely happened. I mean, my God, maybe once every six months or I don't even know, hardly ever. So you can imagine how thrilled we were and how we drank that Coca-Cola so slow because it wasn't refills. And it was just like uh, we had just had a chalice at church. So it was just like the chalice of Coke. And then the little potato chips were exactly like the host, the bread. We we would sit there and, you know, pretend my sisters and brothers and I and my mother would get mad at us. But we would pretend we would give each other communion. So it brings back just loving, fond memories. I had asthma as a child. And when I couldn't breathe, my dad would, when he'd come home, he'd bring me a bottle of cold Coca-Cola. And I remember feeling better. And, I, and it was probably the caffeine that allowed me to breathe a little better. But it doesn't matter. It was psychologically unbelievable. So all through, and it was special. We never had a soda in our home. My mother never bought my entire life uh, from birth till, till I left at uh, 19, uh, 18, 19, there was never a Coca-Cola in our house. And still to this day, there never was. My mother never, ever, ever had a soda um, in her home. But anyway, so they were very, very special. But all through my life and the life of our family, when we were sick, and didn't feel good mentally or physically, Coca-Cola made us feel better. I told her it could just be psychological, but it didn't matter. I believed it was a healing drink for me. So this woman followed me up and, and uh, with back to the table. She followed me with that little suitcase and sat down with me. And she said, could you sit down? And I went, uh, okay. Because I remembered in the back of my head the Coke, and I remembered my mom talking about a stranger. And I said, oh, okay, I'll sit down. So she said, hi, my name's Joy. And no sooner had we sat down, and I took a sip of my Coke, and she said, I'm God's missionary. I spread the word of God. I'm a minister. And she was just this energetic. She, and she got quiet. She said, I listen all the time. I listen to every sound. I listen to a bird. I listen to what other people say. I listen to train, trains on tracks. I listen to the wind. She said, I trust every single thing I hear and see, and I'm always told where to go. She said, I know I'm protected and loved. Now she quit talking and she's glowing. My heart was bumping like I can't even tell you how fast. So I was sitting on my chair in a state of shock, and I was feeling her pure love, I'm telling you, sinking into my heart and soul. Now remember, I went in there flat as a flounder, depressed, and all of a sudden this woman is talking to me like some electric spark, some presence, I'm telling you. And I was feeling pure love again. My heart and soul were sinking, but full of joy. It was like being in some altered state, I swear, sitting there and, and being around like, I swear to God, it felt like our table was surrounded with a glow. And then I asked her how she got her money. And she said, I've got money. I've got money. Money just comes to me. And she said, I always have enough. I have enough money. And I said, I see your suitcase. Um, if you're from up north, you said you were from New York, where are you going to stay tonight? Like, where are you going to, you know, are you going somewhere? Because I didn't want to ask her if she was homeless straight out. I didn't want to, you know, embarrass her, shame her, or catch her in a corner or whatever. She said, I just asked the MARTA bus driver, because I was just on the MARTA bus, which is our public transportation in Atlanta. And she said, I asked the bus driver where was their place to stay. And he gave me the name of a hotel where I could stay the night. And he said, my part, obviously it's how you... You know, they do it as much as you can pay because she said, my part would be $20. And I said, um, wow, because I was trying again to figure out was she homeless or not or what did she need? Then she looked into my eyes straight through me again, looked straight through me, kind of looking up in the sky and then looking straight to me. And she said, you know, you're a minister. God chose you to teach and to minister to all people. God just told me to tell you that, by the way. And God told me to tell you, you're chosen, you're a holy person, and you have a great ministry ahead of you. She got quiet. Now, I want you to know, God's telling me to tell you this now. Your health is perfect. So whatever health you've been having problems with or anything, it's perfect. Don't be, don't be confused or dissuaded. God told me to tell you this. Your health is perfect, and you are God's blessing in this world. You are. God sent you here to heal. You have to listen. 
You have to deeply listen. You've been going too fast. She stopped. And looking deeply into her eyes, I swear to you, I felt as if I were sitting in the presence of, of God. I did. And I was being blessed. I was spellbound. I was silent. I was shocked. I, but there weren't a million thoughts in my head. I was just so filled with love. I thought, is this, if this is not real, what is? This is miracle time at McDonald's. And I was sitting there all of a sudden with tears dripping from my cheeks. Over the last month, I had been struggling about my purpose in this life. I'd been asking, praying for answers um, to this existential crisis. Um, and I know you know this. You're probably, all of you listening, you're old enough to know life comes in waves. It comes in cycles. It comes in seasons. So this had been a little dry season for me. And I was trying to get back into the movement and and uh, whatever the season of this lifetime in my life was. And I had shockingly had a uh, mass on my face. I went to the dermatologist and they removed it and it happened to be cancer. So they did a scan, a brain scan, and found a lesion in my brain. So I was, to be honest with you, afraid and they were very concerned that it was um, a metastasis from my face and or vice versa. So anyway, I had been worried about that. And confused about, okay, God, what's next? You know, it's like a baseball player being up to bat with, you know, strike one, strike two is this strike three. So I was asking about life on very many levels. And here, in front of me, in McDonald's, was this homeless woman I met at the Coke machine speaking prophetic words that I had been desperate to hear. So in that moment, y'all, in that moment, I believe that the McDonald's cup became a chalice. I truly believe that Coca-Cola became wine for me. And I believe that McDonald's store that people can look at or judge or whatever they want became a temple and a cathedral. Okay? Miracles don't make reservations. And I think in past decades, in past millennium, I think that we have considered miracles in and chalices and wine and temples and cathedrals and synagogues. Maybe we go to these places and maybe we haven't opened up our perspective enough, our, our attitudes enough to maybe think miracles are everywhere, everywhere. They don't make reservations. Every single moment of your life is pregnant with possible miracles surrounding you. They're calling you. They're waiting for you. That holy woman that drug me up from that despair I was in was waiting, pregnant. She was sitting there with that broken suitcase with her Coca-Cola. And I walked in, in, in my darkness. But maybe, just maybe, most of us humans are missing these miracles. Maybe we're missing these mysterious divine messages that are calling us. We're too busy. We're on social media, our phone, our computer, tied up with family drama, our own drama that we're creating. We're racing through our routines, and we don't go slow enough to be present in the presence. You must be awake. You must be aware and present to witness these everyday miracles. These miracles are gifts to you, just waiting to be opened, experienced, and shared. You know, just, again, last week I was down and concerned and didn't know what to do and I had to do ugh, so many projects I had some corporate contracts and I said stop I went out on the front porch our trees are just starting to get green in the south it's spring and all of a sudden a male cardinal bright red showed up and he started singing he must have been 15 feet from me I swear to 10 seconds later this female which is darker in color sat there were a couple they sat there for 10 minutes 5 to 10 minutes singing to me Again, my heart opened, and you can say, well, it was just the woman at McDonald's. No, this was another miracle. Stop. The wind blew, my hair blew, the leaves blew, and what was being said to me was, stop. Listen. Remember what that woman said a while back? Stop. I come in many forms to slow you down so you can feel the rhythm of nature, feel the rhythm of your heart, feel the cycles of the souls of your life, okay? And male and female, the yin and the yang, the Tao, of course they were right in front of me saying, balance, listen. Life is a mindful living miracle. Your own energy today becomes a living magnet attracting miracles in your life. 
So the minute you feel closed down or hurried or sore or have a, take a deep breath, please. Go somewhere different, under a tree. Go to McDonald's and get a Coke. Go get a coffee. I don't care what you do. Change your attitude. Change your atmosphere. Sit somewhere. Be somewhere. And I promise it'll happen to you. So today I'm inviting you to open your heart, your mind, your soul into your magical divine space where your own miracles are occurring right now, right now. And they will continue to occur for you. Okay? I promise you. Just remember, miracles don't take reservations. Miracles don't take reservations. They're happening right now. So, remember, now that we're finishing up, remember, go to MindfulLivingNetwork.com. Our tagline is one people, one planet, one future. We are one family. We've got to hold hands and solve all these challenges together and celebrate our joys together. We have a great newsletter. It's very healing and great topics. And please, if you have any ideas or comments about what I'm saying or ideas for shows, please contact me at info, okay, at Mindful Living Network or go to Contact Us. There's a Contact Us click and it has a little thing there. You can write what you want. And if you want me to contact you off the grid, then just leave me a note. Please contact us. Let us know. This is our world. Let's hold our hearts and hands and heal ourselves and our world. Please Also, share us with your family and friends and community. Share the Mindful Living Network. Please, I created this. It was created for all of us, not for me, not for profit, not for anything else. It was created because many, many years ago, many years ago, I started to feel the divisiveness, the separateness, the hate, the, you know, separating, trying to separate us by race or religion or countries or theologies. No, no, no. The more mindful we are, we realize you know, that it's um, just like the stars in the sky. We all have different velocities and frequencies, different fractals, but we're all one, okay? We're all different incarnations here for different purposes, for all, but all the purpose of love. So um, I love our meditation room. Please, we have created a couple new great ones that I love. Um, they're unique meditations. You can go in there and meditate on an icon. You can go around the world and meditate in nature. So go to our meditation room. You can go to the meditation room at YouTube. You can go to the Mindful Living Network and click on the meditation room. So follow us on Twitter or Facebook or Instagram. And I'm so grateful. I'm so humbly grateful that you have listened to this and that you're part of my world, our world. Please know that I love you. Uh, We love you. Our team does. We're here for you. And um, go out into the world and, and, uh, Listen to your own miracles and create your own miracles. And please, take care and know how much you're loved. This is the way I see it. I am Dr. Kathleen Hall.